What's up everybody? Well, as we all know that are interested in the filmmaking process, that oftentimes the director's vision and the studio's vision collaborate in some way to give us some of the best movies that we have ever seen. But it doesn't always quite work out that way. Sometimes you have a lot more studio meddling, a lot more mandates, and sometimes entire overhauls of a film's production that has led to completely different final products than what was the intended original vision. We most recently saw this come to fruition with the Snyder Cut of Justice League, which pretty much universally all the fans and all the critics like better than the studio hack job that was the 2017 release. What other films might actually fit into that space. What other films were started as something and when the audience finally saw it, it was something completely different and possibly something completely worse than what would have been if the studio had let the director make their movie. Well, I'm going to bring you five movies that have infamous stories of studios and directors clashing and a final product that sometimes the directors have completely disavowed and some the fans know the true stories and have demanded the director's cuts. These are top five movies in the horror and sci-fi genre that need a director's cut. And if you guys want to talk about five more movies that have had troubled productions and have we gotten completely different theatrical cuts than was originally intended, this video was done in collaboration with my buddy Sean Chandler over at Sean Chandler Talks About. I'll put his link down below as well as a card. Go over and see his video when you are finished with this one and he's going to tell you about some movies that had plagued productions and different cuts over in the blockbuster and comic book genre. So check these five out and then go over and see the Cousin 5 over at Sean Chandler Talks About. So number five on my list of movies that need a director's cut is a movie that I actually didn't even know the story behind, and that is the director's cut, the McG cut of Terminator Salvation. Now, I feel like I'm on an island. I actually really like the cut that we do have of Terminator Salvation. I know a lot of people do not like any of those movies past the second film and to each their own. But as far as the sequels, I think that Terminator Salvation had so much potential and I actually really enjoyed the futuristic war take to give us a different flavor if we're not going to go back to the tried and true formula that we had in the first two films. So I really like the theatrical cut, but there was originally a much darker cut. There was many different writers that worked on this film at different points in the writing stages, but according to the director McGee, the most that made it into the actual filming stage into this movie is written by him in collaboration with Jonathan Nolan. He says that Jonathan Nolan did the most heavy lifting as far as writing the script of the final product. But that original finished draft of the script was much darker. It focused a lot more on the bleak war tone that they were going for and held the message of the movie to be much more strongly about the thin line between man and machine, where you have a main character that was put to death when men ruled the world, and now this character is going to save the world when machines rule it. Now, aspects of that made it into the theatrical cut, but I can definitely envision a version of that movie where that thematic element is much more the heartbeat of the film than what we actually saw. Movie was also cut back from a rated R to a PG-13 cut, so a lot bloodier in the original cut. There was a lot more uh, gruesome aspects to the deaths of the characters that we did get. It was all watered down a bit to keep that more studio safe PG-13 rating versus the rating that we're used to in this franchise, which was definitely hard R, blood, a lot of death. But the surprising part to me, the part that I actually want to see restored and uh, really shot for the first time because these actors could, with some CGI, I could probably pull this off, is that the third act was actually completely changed right before filming. There was an entirely different, much more bleaker, much darker ending to this film that unfortunately leaked, the script leaked online and then Warner Brothers mandated that they change the ending completely, which basically overhauled the entire point of what they were going for at the end. And that Christian Bale, the one of the main stars of this film was actually so passionate about the original darker ending that that was the main thing that got him passionate about this character and this project. And he was the main one fighting for that ending to be kept all the way through to the end, but ultimately respected the decision of the studio and McGee to change the ending to what we saw. The original third act was going to feature this entirely different final fight between Marcus, the character played by Sam Worthington, 
and also the Helena Bonna Carter, Bottom Carter character, I believe her name was Serena, who was a physical embodiment of this girl that he knew when he was a human. And it was going to be this final face-off where she actually had a physical embodiment. She wasn't just this hologram that told him, hey, guess what, Skynet wins. No, she was going to have a human and Terminator hybrid that was going to fight him in the third act. And that was gonna be a major part of the final act of the film. All leading up to the very ending of the film, which those of you guys that got pissed off at Terminator Dark Fate for some of the decisions that it made, wait till you hear this shit. The original scripted ending of this movie was going to have Christian Bale's John Carter perish in the third act at some point. And Marcus, instead of giving himself up as a sacrifice to change out the hearts of these two characters, which made it into the theatrical cut, he was going to give his entire skeletal body up as a sacrifice. They were going to remove the face and the skin of John Carner's dead body and graft it onto Marcus to keep his image alive as this Christ-like figure in the human resistance. And as all of the surviving characters of John Carner's unit walked into the room to see Marcus wake up with John Carner's likeness, there was going to be a flicker of a red light in his eye and he was going to pull out a weapon and murder every single one of the surviving members, including John Connor's wife. End movie, Skynet wins, fuck you, see you in the sequel. Holy shit, you wanna talk about one of the most bleak, no, definitely the most bleak thing that would have ever existed in the Terminator universe. And <laughs> while I don't know how well the, uh, the audience or the fans would have reacted to that, boom! Uh, I kind of want to see that. That's a pretty ballsy, badass way to end a movie, and I can see why a creative figure like Christian Bale would be so passionate for a ballsy ending like that. I want to see the McG cut. Number four is going to be Shane Black's The Predator. This is another one that's known pretty well by fans of the genre, and especially fans of this franchise. This movie was completely overhauled, reshot, shifted around. It, it, it's an absolute incoherent mess when you see the theatrical cut. And to be honest with you, I don't really know if you can call this a director's cut, because I have yet to be able to find solid evidence of whether or not a lot of these reshoots and new changes and mandates were done by the studio, or if this was Shane Black's doing himself. I honestly don't know. I love Shane Black. I'm a Shane Black fanatic, so part of me wants to believe that his original cut of the film was what we were going to get, and then the studio changed all this bullshit that gave us this theatrical cut that I did not like at all. But who knows? I mean, this very well could have been the studio changing things. There very well could have been Shane Black changing things. But nonetheless, I want the other cut of this film. But what does that other cut have, you ask? Well, if you've seen the theatrical cut of The Predator, you see that this is a storyline where a hunter predator comes down and starts fucking up the works. There's an autistic kid. There's this whole group of ragtag loonies that are called the loonies, I believe. All leading to a third act where all of your main characters that have survived to this point go and uh, fight this mutated, evolved predator, this ultimate predator, if you will, that literally rips the spine out of the main predator for the first two acts of the film. And it ends in this gigantic, over-the-top, CGI-ridden, ship battle that crashes in the woods and even the CGI on the Predator itself looks terrible. The, the movie is an incoherent mess for the timeline because it went from taking over place of multiple days to being shot to all be one night, but they leave the dialogue in referencing the previous night. Character deaths were changed. There was a lot that got overhauled with this movie, starting with this entire subplot that Edward James Almost was going to be in charge of Area 51. And inside of Area 51, we were going to have two defected predators that were stationed there and eventually left or break, broke out of the Area 51 containment to help the main characters take on the main bad guy, Evolved Predator. There's an entire sequence shot. There's still shots out there. There's production stills that show two predators onto a tank with some of the main characters from these little loony group. And that was removed from the movie entirely. It was removed for the sake of taking the action from daytime to nighttime. Because what I had read was that the people in charge of this film did not understand that characters like Predators that are supposed to be camouflaged and sticking to shadows would not make any coherent sense having action scenes in the daytime rather than nighttime. So they switched it to make it all Halloween night. 
Did you motherfuckers ever see the first movie? Because most of that shit is in daytime. That's the whole fear aspect of the Predator is that it doesn't have to kick your ass at night. It can fuck you up during the daytime and you'll be lucky to see it even amongst the trees or the suburban neighborhood that this movie takes place in. That makes absolutely no sense. Whoever made that decision, you're an idiot. Then you have this entire thing in the third act where character deaths were shifted around and quickened and rather than people dying off gradually from the middle part of the film all the way through to the ending, you have everybody dying in the third act in quick succession to the point where some character deaths are completely incoherently shot and edited that almost every single person that I saw talk about this film was like, when the hell did Sterling K. Brown's character die? Oh, that was the guy that just had the malfunction and, and his death was literally like two frames? Yeah, another mistake. And part of what was going to probably be causing a lot of the original deaths of these characters was as the main characters converged onto this ultimate predator and finding his ship for this final battle, originally the ultimate predator was going to be releasing these monsters out, which were failed predator evolution experiments. You were gonna have predators with multiple limbs, predators with tentacles coming after our main characters, and there was gonna be an entire battle scene just with those abomination monsters to where the main characters is going to eventually triumph over them by manipulating their self-destruct collars, which just sounds badass and sounds so wacky and crazy that it would match the crazy tone of this and I would have liked to have seen that. All of that washed away for this generic third act where they ride this ship and it's on a obviously CGI background that just was so much weaker than the CGI in the earlier parts of the film. There's even time passages that makes no sense to where Olivia Munn's able to go miles when she was not even attached to this ship in seconds or minutes or whatever you want to call it. It's incoherent. It's a movie that absolutely destroys itself with all of these editing mandates and changes and trying to make everything fit into this nice little bullshit studio package or Shane Black package. It, it, it's, a, it's a disaster. I wanna see the original cut of this film. The shit's shot, give it some money. Nobody cares, there, there's very few fans of this film. Sorry, CP and Brian. I wanna see the original cut. I wanna see where this would have been in the original script that you guys okayed. And I'll even go a step further and tell you to Give a pile of money to Arnold Schwarzenegger and get the intended ending stinger. If you guys have seen The Predator, you've seen the, the ending tagline. I don't even remember if this was post credits or not, but you had this whole thing where Boyd Holbrook walks into this room and there's this package that the Predators have left and there's like all this swirling music and it goes up and it opens it up and it's like this Iron Man suit they call the Predator Killer. It's this human suit that's going to adhere to somebody and give them the tools necessary to fight Predators and it is the most garbage, cheesy ass, studio mandated ending that I have ever seen. That is obviously a reshoot from start to, be, to finish. There was an intended ending that was written that was pitched and they were trying their best to get Arnold Schwarzenegger to agree to, to where after the final act of this film, Dutch from the first film would land in a helicopter and recruit all the surviving characters for a war with the Predators, which would probably lead to a fifth film. Don't care how I want it now. Just give us that. D use a CGI, Arnold. I don't give a shit. Just, just get rid of that Predator killer bullshit, please. That is embarrassing. Number three is a little movie called Event Horizon. So a lot of horror sci-fi fans know this film. It is a bit of a cult classic, but a lot of people do know about it. This was one of the first films by Paul W.S. Anderson. Yes, the, the Resident Evil guy. He did make a couple of good movies, in my opinion. But uh, Event Horizon is a space... Hellraiser movie essentially where you have a group of people that are going off to find this lost ship event horizon that went into a black hole and was just detected that it came back through the black hole and when they get there they find out that the ship had went into some site some type of a hell dimension it's tainted the ship and everybody in this crew slowly starts to die off in gory ways and there was actually an original cut of this movie that was shot that was edited together and was shown to test audiences that was much darker a lot gorier, had a lot more focus on the biblical hell themes that were throughout this, and even had more backstory for the characters and explanation of this hell dimension. And a lot of us fans were really hoping that when this uh, Scream Factory release finally came out, that they were probably going to assemble that cut, or at least assemble that footage together for some type of a special feature. But unfortunately, 
That footage no longer exists, but we'll get into it. The original cut of this film that was thrown together for a test screen was actually 130 minutes long. And even the director, Paul W.S. Anderson, admits that the, you know, the, the quickened timeline that they had to throw this together, that cut was too long. It was a little bit um, under-directed. It was, it was definitely excess. But within that cut was a lot of excess gore, a lot more sequences of hallucinations. There was even this famed blood orgy scene that was going to show the dead and even some of the living crew members being tortured, uh, being mutilated, even being raped. <laughs> and uh, all of that was taken away when they showed this to a test audience. And uh, you know, you get even those stories that we see a dime a dozen where the director and the producer were saying that people were, you know, fainting and passing out in the test screenings. What a bunch of pussies. All you bitches that go out to these test screenings that are that weak, just, just stay out of horror movie screenings because you're fucking it up for the rest of us. We, it was, it was, it was horrible. We thought it was awesome. Yeah, we thought it was great. <laughs> and, uh, and if you're going to go to hell, you've got to go. But Paramount Studios stopped looking at the dailies throughout the production of the film before all of these gory scenes were shot later on in the production. And that was actually the first cut that the studio watched was along with this test audience. So anyway, they didn't like the movie at all. And, uh, and they, um, you know, they, they wanted the movie trimmed down. They thought it was way too long and they wanted a lot of the violence taken out. At one point they asked whether it could be a PG-13. Which when you see the movie is like, I mean, There's I don't know. No way that could happen. It could have been a short film, I guess. And after that test audience reaction, where most people in the audience reacted poorly to the excess gore and to the blood orgy scene and some of the uh, additional character development, that they mandated that that 130 cut of this movie get dropped down to a 96 minute cut, which is the theatrical cut that we have all watched since then. That is a lot of movie that is cut. And ever since then, Paul W.S. Anderson has been very firm in his opinion that at least 10 to 20 minutes of footage needs to be restored to this movie to make it even better, to make it more, co more coherent, to have more motivations for some of these crew members signing on and going into this potentially suicide mission to show more explanation and more exploration of this hell dimension and how it works and why it's there, why it's attached to a black hole. And for those of us gore hounds, adding in a lot more of the gore that was originally shot for this film, including the famed blood orgy scene. They even went as far into this famed scene to hire people, amputees, to be used for practical effects for mutilation scenes. They even hired pornographic actors to more accurately represent sex scenes for the, the hell torture orgy that was going on in this scene through all of these different hallucination sequences throughout the third act of the film. And while maybe it's going a little too far to add, to add rape and all that shit into a movie like this, uh, I definitely, as a horror fan, for a, a movie that for all intents and purposes is like a spiritual Hellraiser sequel, when you have torture and you have hell as a main theme of your movie, it does make sense to flesh out that side of things as much as possible. And I do think that there's a cut of this film that would have a respectable amount of that stuff added back in that would give us the ultimate cut of this movie, the Paul W.S. Anderson cut of Event Horizon. But unfortunately, as I alluded to earlier, that footage, according to the director, no longer exists. My disappointment is immeasurable. And my day is ruined. It was not taken care of in a way that would keep these uh, dailies, keep these original shots intact. It was not uh, maintained well. And so the only hope that rests with us fans and the director and the original producer of this film that we would ever even see, let alone see spliced back into the film, but even see the footage that was shot in these original scenes is a VHS tape that they found in 2012, which for all intents and purposes is missing again now that we're you know almost a decade after that. So unfortunately for us fans of this film, we're probably never going to see that assembly cut, never gonna see the true intention of this film, which I actually maintain as a pretty damn good sci-fi horror flick. So we're stuck with the watered down studio mandated 96 minute theatrical cut, which is still pretty good, but give me more. Number two is going to be The Thing 2011, The Thing prequel that for some reason was just titled as The Thing, but 
that's a topic for another video. Nonetheless, this is an infamous story that pretty much all horror fans are familiar with. The Thing, John Carpenter's film, yeah, the, the greatest horror movie of all time as far as I'm concerned, its biggest legacy is how incredible the practical effects, the practical gore work, the monster effects, all the nastiness of that movie and it still holds up to this day. It is literally the example that horror fans pull out when we talk about the difference between practical old school effects and modern computer generated effects. The thing is practically the Bible for horror effects. When the prequel was in production, when they were filming it, they filmed the entire movie using practical effects because they knew that that was such an important part of the legacy, that was such an important thing to the fans of this movie as well as anybody that worked on the original film that they were absolutely going to keep that part of the film intact. And unfortunately, in post-production, Universal demanded that they go back and reshoot all of these scenes, mask all of the practical effects work by ADI, and use CGI to cover all of it, and not very good CGI at that. It's actually some of the worst CGI I've ever seen. You're too stupid to have a good turn. And they completely reshot the ending, which I did not know until researching for this video. The original ending of this movie actually had Mary Elizabeth Winstead's character finding the buried alien ship, going inside of it, and finding the dead pilot, which was going to be a completely different species and it was going to lead you to believe that the thing was just a specimen collected by this pilot and his species in this ship that escaped, took over, crashed the ship onto Earth. That is actually a pretty badass origin for the thing, that it was actually an alien collected by an alien and then it lands on Earth and now we have the events of these two films. But all of that was taken away and washed away forever in favor of a very generic studio blockbuster ending where Mary Elizabeth Winstead still discovers this ship and then has this fight with one of the characters, I believe his name was Sander, that is now a thing monster and it's one of the most horrible generic thing, computer generated pieces of shit antagonist that I've ever seen. This kills me because you know what? As much as I love the original The Thing, John Carpenter's film, it's my favorite horror film of all time. I really enjoy what they did story-wise with this prequel. I think that it actually is genius how well things are set up to lead in to that original film. You can literally bookend these movies and watch them as one film because the storylines are tied together so meticulously. But I cannot stand watching the prequel because of these horrible effects. It literally ruins the movie for me. If you had the original practical effects restored in a, a director's cut or an original assembly cut, whatever they want to call this, I guarantee you this film would jump at least two stars for me. That's how much the uh, CGI effects kill this film. I've seen it numerous times. I rewatched it recently for my 31 on 31 last October, and I just want, I want to love this movie so much because it has all of the pieces there for me to love it as a thing fanatic. But those CGI effects mandated by the stupid ass studio heads destroy what could be a genius companion piece to what I call the greatest horror film of all time. Release the ADI cut, bitches. Fair enough. You made about seven or eight good points there that I can't refute. But coming in at number one is not only the director's cut that I want to see the most out of the list of these films, but it's also the director's cut that we have the most potential to actually see at some point because the footage does exist. The campaign for this cut does exist. And being that the fact that the director is unfortunately no longer with us, the fans clamoring for this is just tenfold compared to all the other films. And that is Wes Craven's Cursed. Now, those of you that are Wes Craven fans, those of you that are horror fans, have probably either never seen this movie, never heard of this movie, or watched it and never watched it again because it is absolutely one of the lesser Wes Craven works. I can still have fun with a theatrical cut, but it's definitely not uh, a great movie whatsoever. But little did I know how insane the production story of this movie actually was. The original intention of Wes Craven's Cursed was going to be 
a legitimate reinvention of the werewolf subgenre, which is something that, God bless him, Wes Craven had done multiple times up to this point with Scream. You could even say with Wes Craven's new Nightmare, even with some of the Scream sequels, just continuing to give life to the horror genre, to the slasher genre. I think if anybody, if any of the horror director Mount Rushmore's were to come out of the woodworks and reinvent a tried and true formula like a werewolf movie, it would have been him. That was his destiny. That was his intention with this film. And Kevin Williamson, his scream script writer, came in and the original cut of this movie, the original intention was going to be a hard R, a lot of gore, not nearly as much camp, and it was going to focus on three strangers that got into an accident, were attacked by a werewolf, and then we have the rest of our film. You were gonna have Christina Ricci, and you were going to have Jesse Eisenberg, who were not siblings in the original cut of this film, followed by Skeet Ulrich of Scream fame, who was a third character that was cut entirely from the theatrical cut of this movie. Hi, E.T., welcome to the set of Cursed. Hollywood is known as a dog-eat-dog -dog town, but in their new movie, Cursed, Skeet and Christina find that out the hard way when they come face-to-face -face with a werewolf. But after production went through and over 90% of this movie was shot and done, Bob Weinstein came in, shut production down, and mandated that damn near the entire thing be rewritten, reshot, and redone. It took over a year and three separate events of reshooting to splice together the eventual mangled studio cut that we got in the theaters of Wes Craven's Cursed. And possibly one of the greatest casualties of this entire delay and reshoot mandate was that Rick Baker's original werewolf and gore effects were all reshot and covered up with very poor CGI. The only way I would do this is if you don't have an opinion and Wes doesn't have an opinion, you just let me make what I think is best for this film. It's the only way I can make it cool in the time that you have. I can't play the change this, change that game. You know, absolutely. You know. <laughs> of course, that's not the case. No. <laughs> they started up again. I, I didn't do it. I was on something else. Someone else took over. They, uh. they changed everything that I made. They didn't use a lot of what I made. But the film has a single card opening credit that says Rick Baker on it. Was the thing 2011, was that the same production company? Because it's the same stupid ass decision. Why in God's name would you ever cover up practical effects in a horror film with fucking CGI? Learn, stop doing that. No, but you wouldn't listen. Why, you stupid fuck. Look at you now. The delayed production and the multiple sessions of reshoots went on for so obnoxiously long that many of the main and side characters of this movie and the actors just left production and had to be completely cut out of the movie. Mandy Moore, Robert Forster, the great Robert Forster was supposed to be in this, and even Omar Epps. Characters completely gone from the theatrical cut. I bet before I told you that, you didn't realize they were supposed to be in this movie, did you? Oh, and as if that wasn't bad enough, uh, yeah, there was a Nightmare on Elm Street reunion planned for this film. Heather Langenkamp was also cut. Thanks, Weinstein. And they even went as far as to write and shoot three separate endings for this movie. Actually, to correct myself, they only shot two. The original ending that was part of the original shoot, the original script of this film, was part of that 10% lingering that never actually got shot, the coherent ending to this movie. But when they went to redo the second version of this film, they filmed, shot, and edited a completely different ending. And even after that was done, Bob Weinstein came in again totally denied that ending, said that it had to be redone, and they went back for another round of reshoots to completely write, rehaul, and reshoot a third ending, which was the theatrical ending that we saw where Joshua Jackson was re revealed to be the, the main werewolf, comes in and tries to kill the main two sibling characters, which admittedly does not make a whole lot of coherent sense with most of the rest of the film, and really does feel tacked onto the third act. That was the ending that apparently was appropriate for Mr. Weinstein. You can go through into the depths of the internet and find actual interview notes from everybody from Wes Craven all the way through to the cast, Christina Ricci, even Jesse Eisenberg, probably one of the more spoken out people against it, all the way to Judy Greer. Halloween 2018 chick was in this movie and every single one of them just denounce 
the theatrical cut and talk about how miserable the shoot was, how miserable the production was. And Jesse Eisenberg especially was just like, the original film was gonna be brilliant. It was gonna be such a wild, zany reinvention of this genre. And then they just came in and just made it as stupid as possible, making the main two characters siblings and everything just turned into garbage cliches, which the final cut absolutely was over and over and over throughout the runtime. But there is hope because even after the Snyder Cut, there continues to be a Release the Craven Cut campaign out there. There it continues to be fan outcry to finally see the original version of this film. And all of that footage still exists. There's a bit of confusion and battling over who actually holds the footage, who has the rights to it. Is it the Weinstein Company? or is it Lantern Entertainment? But that 90% shot original film exists. It's out there. It only needs to be edited and scored. And there is going to be, have to be some kind of a compromise for that 10% for that ending. There's probably gonna be some theatrical footage that's gonna to have to be used to piece together the best ending that they can. So even the if we get this cut, it's not going to be 100% the original intention. But man, a Wes Craven directed Kevin Williamson written reinvention of the werewolf genre. I want to see that movie. I can have fun, guilty pleasure fun, with the theatrical cut, the mangled studio Weinstein cut of Cursed, but I, as a fan, will never be satisfied until I see the Craven cut of Cursed. So that's it guys, that is my top five movies that need a director's cut. Do you agree with these? Are there more stories out there? I know Hellraiser Bloodline's a big one out there, but I don't really care to see any cut of that movie. So let me know down below if there is other horror or sci-fi movies that need a director's cut. And if you want to check out some blockbuster and comic book films that need a director's cut, be sure to check down below in the video description and go over to Sean Chandler Talks About and see the companion video to this and check out his top five movies that need a director's cut. Thank you guys for watching. Please like and share this video and hit that subscribe button so you can see more awesome top fives, rankings, and reviews like this. And remember guys, as always, opinions are like assholes, but that doesn't mean that you have to be. You listen in studios, 